I can't begin to tell you how excited I am to have my guest on today. I have been enamored with his music for a quarter of a century now, when you think about it, which is kind of shocking. Um, first time I heard his name was with Frank Zappa's 88 band. And then I saw him again with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani on the G3 tour. And I was asking myself, who is this guy in the funny hat playing exactly what Steve Vai is playing? And I had to know more about him. So please, I'd like to welcome Mr. Mike Keneally. How are you doing today, my friend? Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm glad to have you here. I, it's, you know, the honor is mine. Believe me, I've been I've been a super fan for a while. You know, every everything else is going on around me, but eventually Mike Keneally has to come into play. I have to know what's going on. You're looking very comfortable in your in your room there. Which <laughs> I'm, the, I'm extremely cozy here, which is good because it's, <laughs> if I was to step outside right now, I would uh, instantly freeze. But yeah, and, yeah. and here I am. I'm I'm comfy as all get out. Well, good, good. We're gonna. We're going to keep you comfy. That's the uh, that's the goal today, no doubt about it. Excellent. How are things going? Um, it's not officially post COVID, but the world has kind of opened up. How are things going for you now that you're able to get back out there? Um, it's uh, busy, you know. I, that I I've been trying to to slice up my time uh, so that I'm able to play with with various groups because I've been gigging pretty frequently with uh with the Zappa band and yes. then also with this this uh, this organization called Project which is uh Jonathan Movers uh project and uh I'm preparing to do some stuff with my band uh Beer for Dolphins in in January and then shortly after that I'm going to be out uh touring with uh, with Devin Townsend again so there's oh, there are you know a lot of I'm grateful that there's that there have been you know opportunities and and gigs coming in and and just all sorts of cool projects and then I have uh you know I'm, I'm about to finally put out a, a a solo record it's been uh something like 6 7 years since since the last one so I've been getting that uh prepared for release and at the same time uh, the album that's that's ready, almost ready to come out after that uh, is, you know, that's that's about, I'd say, 70 percent done. So I've been, you know, preparing material for that as well. So when I'm home, I'm busy. And when I'm out, I'm busy. So I'm I'm, I'm grateful. It, it, it really seems like, uh, you know, it, we've we have officially entered into the new normal. It'll never be the old normal again. But right. uh it's it's not like uh, lockdown was. That's for sure. There's 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 a lot going on. Well, that's a good thing. It's always a good yeah. to keep busy. Mm -hmm. I last caught you on stage with the uh, the Zappa band opening for uh, King Crimson uh, mm. in twenty one. Where were we? That was at the Ravinia out uh, just north of Chicago, and you guys were amazing. Ab absolutely amazing. There, Thank you. there aren't enough platitudes I can throw at you. <laughs> I'm, wow. I'm really happy that 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 uh, project uh, came together. If anybody doesn't know what it is, it's it's uh, primarily guys uh, like myself who played with uh, with the with Frank Zappa. So uh, apart from me, there's there's Ray White and Robert Martin and Scott Tunis, and then on drums is Joe Travers, who's also the drummer in in my my band, Beer for Dolphins, and works for uh, the Zappa Trust as the the Vault Meister putting together all the amazing archival releases that have been coming out. And then a, another guitar player named Jamie Kime. And so the, the six of us are, are the Zappa band, uh, where the, the, the officially, uh, sanctioned Zappa group. Uh, so we're able to use that name <laughs> and, uh, and it's just, I mean, that, that, that was literally the first thing after lockdown was going out and doing that crimson tour. So that was an outrageous, uh, just everything about it felt unreal, you know, uh, just to be out of the house uh, at all. And then, and then to be opening for Crimson, there was just a real intense uh, feeling surrounding the whole thing. Uh, we would just go on stage and, and explode and we only had 45 minutes and it was literally to the second 45 minutes. If, if, if we, if we exceeded that, uh, we would be, uh, unceremoniously ejected from the stage. So we, we, uh, we had to have everything really timed out to to the to the last nano beat, and uh, it, which in some ways is a little strange because part of the the Frank uh, mindset is is to be able to be 
uh, spontaneous and and make room for random occurrences but we we didn't have that luxury so we had things timed out the lengths of solos and everything right. just to be a really concentrated powerful 45 minute set and in, in some ways i think that was good because it, it forced us to really get our act together and it also meant that night after night playing the same show we just got really really good at it <laughs> and so we uh, you know that that was uh, an intense way to come out of lockdown uh to go out on the road and you know just to be playing to a bunch of people i think that 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 tour that for king crimson to come over and and do that it might have been the first uh band that was based essentially in the uk coming to to the us uh post lockdown to do a, a tour of that magnitude so there were a, a lot of kind of uh sort of unprecedented uh, things attached to that. And then to find out afterward that that was effectively the last King Crimson tour, or it, at least it, it, it appears that there's a good chance that that's the case. So to have been a part of it, that, that I just feel very privileged to have been there. Um, be two layers of pressure. I mean, the first gig coming out of lockdown, you have to play some unbelievably complicated music. And as a lead into one of the, bigger bands in the, for lack of a better phrase, progressive rock era. So it's uh, it's kind of dangerous to miss a note, I would be thinking. How how hard was practice before you got out? Um, well, I mean, I, I think we were, we were all aware of the, the sort of the magnitude of the, of the occasion. So, uh, everybody was showed up at, at, uh, rehearsals pretty, pretty well prepared. And then, and then, but there's always room for growth, of course. So I'm, right, I'm right. sure if we, if, if, if I was to listen to the recordings of the, the first shows on that tour, there would be some, some, you know, pretty hairy, uh, imperfect stuff going on. But, uh, but uh, that's just the nature of the beast. When you're on the road, the, the, the beginning of the tour tends to be a little, a little shaky. And then as, as time goes on and you just, uh, you know, feel more comfortable in your own skin and in, in the skin of the music, it, it just, uh, things mesh and cohere and, and come together. And, and, uh, and by the end of it, we really did feel like we were, were operating as, as one organism and the, the audience response was so gratifying. Uh, it, it was very intense and we, we were all like hoping that coming out of that, we would it just like, uh, uh, build on that momentum and do a lot more shows, but it's, it, there's, you know, a, a lot of growing pains, uh, in the, in the post lockdown era. Uh, and the, the concert industry is, uh, is, has just a, a, a lot of, uh, <laughs> complexity, uh, financially and, and just literally in terms of the, the bare minimum of what's required to make a tour go like a tour bus, for instance, uh, while, while we were preparing for the Zappa band tour that we did earlier this year, which ended up just being a couple of weeks um, on the East coast. Uh, we didn't know until very close to the, the intended start date, whether we were even going to have a bus. Um, oh, wow. uh, part of it is that there are, that there were so many bands cause a lot of people had, you know, pent up demand after, after being locked up at home for so long, and then everybody was suddenly touring at the same time. Uh, uh concurrently with that, a, a lot of the, the, the nuts and bolts, uh, things that are required to make tours work. Uh, these industries, these, these companies, uh, were in very, very dire financial straits from not making any money for, for several years. So the, the cost of everything, uh, became hiked. So suddenly it became two, three, four times more expensive to mount a tour. Uh, if you could even, cheap to begin with. and it wasn't cheap to begin with. So that's, even if you could get a bus, it would be you know, more expensive than it was. Or if you wanted to pay what you used to pay for a bus, it might not be a bus you'd ever want to spend time in. <laughs> so it was, you know, just like a, a lot of, uh, real world, uh, things that you suddenly have to contend with. And it all just like, makes you realize yet again, what, a, what an extremely impractical way of quote, make a, making a living har har, uh, going on the road is, but, you know, especially since, you know, you also can't make any money from selling your, uh, your, your records anymore. Um, so it, it used to be that, 
okay, yeah, no, no one's buying records, but at least you can go out on the road and, and, you know, sell some tickets and sell some merch. N- now, even that's unless, you know, obviously, unless you're, you're Taylor Swift or somebody, um, uh, even that is, is not what it used to be. So it's, it, it, it is a challenge, but at, at the same time, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm still seeing all these, these different groups that I work with and, and different opportunities and different tours. And, and, and I just see my, my calendar, uh, for next year looking dauntingly full. If, if it all happens, all the stuff that's, that's being proposed, if, if it all actually goes down, um, I'll be out quite a bit. So right now for me, the biggest challenge is, is trying to make time to play my own music because I've got an album coming out in January and no time to, to, uh, to play gigs, to support it. But you also have to be, uh, pretty pragmatic about that. If, if you've got, if you get a, an offer to play a tour that somebody's going to pay you to do, as opposed to doing your own tour, which is from the get go, a, a money losing, uh, uh, proposition is you have to pay for rehearsals. You have to pay for transportation. You have to pay the band members. It, it, there's not going to be anything left to pay yourself. So, um, that's, that's why I kind of have no choice, but to, to do other people's tours, but I'm also grateful that other people's tours are even on the table. You know, it's like, a, a, plus Makes I just, I just like, I just like variety. You know, it, it, it excites me to go from one band to another band to another band. It's, I, it's when I, when I look back at, at the years of all the different projects I've done and how, you know, r- radically different they can, they can be from one another. Uh, it just, it, it, it makes me happy. <laughs> Good thing. Now, uh, talking of that, uh, how British that was talking of that, uh, um, <laughs> you get an offer to do a show and you are equally fabulous on both keyboards and guitar. When you hear a song and somebody says to you, I want you to play, are you, which do you listen to the arrangement, decide where you want to go, or do they tell you what it is they need from you? How does that work for you? Well, if somebody sends me, uh, like if I'm doing somebody's tour and they say, well, we, you know, we're, we're going to do this song. And then they send me the, the, the track I'll listen to what's there. And then, you know, and of course they'll tell me if they want me to play guitar or keyboard on it. Um, you know, I'll listen to what's there and I'll learn what's there, but these things always evolve things. Uh, things always mutate in performance, uh, because, there's so much you can do in a studio mix to make things mesh that be, can can be impractical to to try and uh, replicate that stuff precisely in a live performance situation. Just because it's, a live performance situation is much more hectic, and often you can have a, a, a studio recording that's uh, that's very dense and you know just very data intensive. And, and in order to make the thing work on stage, you know, like you might have to take a part that's played very, very, uh, uh, legato on, on a recording and make it very staccato in live performance, just because if you don't make those notes shorter, all of a sudden it's just like, you know, audio soup, uh, (laughs) and, and you, you might be, you know, looking to chop the ingredients a little more finely, uh, so it's, it's, it's just about using, especially after you've been doing it for, you know, a number of decades, it's about using your ears and your instincts to, to, you know, feel out what are the, the right things to do with this in order to make it sing, so to speak on stage, as opposed to it just being something to, to trudge through and execute. Um, Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. when you, uh, when you compose a song, we're just going to go to your record. Are you already thinking about the live arrangement or are you just locked into what's going to happen in the studio and you're going to figure that out later. Yeah. It's it, very, very rarely am I thinking about, about live performance when I'm, when I'm doing recording, it's, it's always about just a weird sound that I have in my head that I'm trying to capture. And I've, and I've always considered the, the, the studio recordings and then the later live performance to be, you know, not just different animals, but it, the, I, I welcome the fact that they're different animals. I, I really don't, I don't, spend any time trying to replicate studio arrangements, uh, in, in live performance. I, I, I think of the records as blueprints. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, there, there are two things. 
the records are, are, are finished objects. They're you know, like, that's, that is a piece of art that's done. And then I'll, I'll go through the album and I'll say, okay, these songs are, are, can, might, might be practical for live performance. These other songs would be completely impractical to try to, to try to, to bring off live with, you know, the, the resources of my band. And now I have an okay. amazing band. Uh, but I, I have a tendency to like to layer things in, in the recording studio because, you know, I'm, I, I do, I, I take kind of a painterly approach to, to recording, which means that in order to get this part of a song to sound exactly the way I want it to sound, the way I'm hearing it in my head, I might need to have like five guitars happening just for a moment. And right. then, and then it stops and it all strips down to just one guitar or something like that. Or, you know, I'm, I might, it, it, since I play both guitar and keyboard, it, I'm, I might, a part of a song in the studio might feature guitar very s strongly and then instantly switch to keyboard very strongly in a way that's not practical for me to do on stage. Even though I do a lot of back and forth between the guitar and the keyboard on stage, there are times where there's something in a recording that's just physically impossible to bring off in a live recording. You know, and I do have a, a, sometimes one, sometimes two additional guitar players in my band. So there's, there's always that possibility to replicate a lot of the guitar, the, the guitar architecture that I do in, in my uh, studio stuff. Well, that's, that's my new um, favorite word now. I'm, I'm using that. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's, it's just about being practical about it. I, it, it, it I, I'm not precious about the, the, the songs at all. It's, it, I, I don't think, I don't listen to a record and think, oh, that's, that's perfect. Then it, it must be replicated precisely that way on stage. Um, to me, that's a losing battle. And I would rather use the, uh, the, like I said earlier, I'd rather use the, the studio recording as a blueprint for something new to happen on stage every time we play it. Right. And that's, you know, one of the things that I like best about my band and, and, you know, the, the now, you know, coming up on 30 years that I've, that I've been playing my own music live, you know, you go back through these live recordings and the same song never sounds the same, you know, if, if you listen to different performances of it. And to me, that's a desirable situation. <laughs> I just happened to grab, we won't go too deeply into it. I just happened to grab bacon at the potato. <laughs> I was thinking because that, this is one of my favorite live recordings. I mean, it's just that we, we got lucky with that. You know, that was, that was, that was a night where we did, everything just happened to fall into place and we happened to be re doing multi-track recording and, and video recording. We didn't know necessarily that we were going to make a DVD of that, but we just had, you know, friends that were, that were, that because we're lucky to have beautiful friends who want to document the performances. Right. So we knew that we were recording it, you know, in multi-track. Uh, but then we also had, you know, what turned out to be very good visual coverage. So we were, we were able to do that CD DVD package, which is unfortunately out of print now. Um, uh -huh. but, but, uh, <laughs> well, you can't have mine, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, and then as what's sort of doubly remarkable is that that was part of a, a series of shows that we were doing, uh, with, with Brian, uh, Beller, who's the bass player in my band. Uh, but he had just put out his, uh, second solo record. And so we would come out it, the name of the, the tour was, uh, they're both the same band. Uh, we, we would come out as the opening act, which is the Brian Beller band and play a set of, of his music. And then we would come back after an intermission as you know, the Mike Keneally band and do a set of my music. And, and he also put out a live album and a DVD called Wednesday night live from the, from the very same night that that yes. was recorded. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. And so it was just a, a very, uh, it was a powerful and, and creative night that, you know, we managed to get some, you know, several it, really, it, really, it wasn't stuff. just the notes you played. It wasn't just that the notes were beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but I could see how much fun you guys were having. You know, uh, my dilemma remain, remains my absolute favorite moment. I, Cause I think I asked you several years ago, were you having as much fun as it looked like you were having? Yeah. You can't fake that, or at least I can't. Um, <laughs> and, and I also can't, disguise it, you know, when I'm, when I'm enjoying myself that much, it's impossible for me to, to look otherwise. Um, and so, you shouldn't. yeah. And that, yeah. Uh, and that, and I, that's, that's come back to me, uh, fairly often that people will, will mention to me that one of the things they like about the stuff that I do is that it's, 
you know, obviously it's very, you know, complex and intricate and requires a, a lot of, uh, rehearsal and, and in, intensiveness and focus to, to play the stuff. Um, but it doesn't look like we're, uh, hard at work or we're struggling or we're you know, angry about it or, <laughs> or any of that, or, or that we're super studious or, or whatever. It, it just looks like we're having a good time because we are. Um, right. but it, that, that, but I also think that's just, it's a reflection of my feeling. And I'm sure that, that this had a lot to do with, you know, just being so completely immersed in, in Frank when I was growing up. And obviously, you know, he was just as much about having a good time as, and, and laughing as he was about, uh, these ridiculously intricate compositions, you know, it's, it's that balance has always been really appealing to me. And I always enjoyed going to see a band that clearly were enjoying themselves while at the same time executing this absolutely mind blowing stuff. You know, that, that, that one, two punch was just always unbeatable for me. So you know. I need to lean on cliche, but it's, it's having your cake and eating it too, you know, or anything yeah. else. I think that's, that's kind of the way I feel. Um, I never asked an artist for their favorite album because the times people get asked, they say, well, it's like trying to pick my favorite child. Mm-hmm. So I kind of feel the same way about your catalog. This is not just shameless, <laughs> shameless ingratiation here. I love everything you do. And I would love to celebrate a couple of, of your records, starting with the records you did with Andy, uh, with Andy Partridge, Wing Beat mm. Fantastic, which is now a decade old, which time is moving too fast, but this time is just, does fly. <laughs> it's just craziness. <laughs> How did that? How did that come to pass? I don't think you just casually stroll in and, and tell you know one of the most gifted songwriters on earth, hey, let's make a record. How did that come together? Well, what's funny is that I, neither Andy nor I can remember which of us first proposed uh, doing the the. Well, I don't even think we necessarily thought of it as a record. It was more just about let's write together, and we had known one another for for almost twenty years at the point that we sat down and started. Uh, composing together because he came he and dave gregory from xtc uh both came to see the frank zappa band uh in birmingham england in 1988 at the end at the invitation of of scott tunis the bass player in the zappa band who called up virgin records because xtc were, were still were signed well they were together and they were also signed to virgin at the time and uh I remember it very clearly, Scott being sitting, being in my hotel room on the Zappa tour. We were in the UK. It was just before we started doing the run of shows in the UK. And, and Scott, who was just as huge an XTC fan as I was, said, I'm going to, I'm going to find the number. I'm going to call XT, I'm going to call Virgin Records and I'm going to invite XTC to the show. And I just thought okay. that this was the, you might as well invite the Beatles or God <laughs> or an asteroid, you know, just, <laughs> I, d- I didn't think there was any hope of it leading to anything. And then there all of a sudden was Andy Partridge and Dave Gregory at, at the Birmingham show, um, which was mind blowing. And, and subsequently I found out that, you know, it was, it was five years after Andy said, I'm not, I'm not doing any more live playing. And in that time, I don't, I don't know if he'd even gone to a single concert you know he was definitely at home it was, wow. he, it was the, he had you know forsworn many of the of the the the, the, the much of the outside world it was was no longer of interest to him uh right. so but he was sufficiently enough intrigued and you know interested in frank you know once word got to him that this invitation had come through and dave was a huge zappa fan so he was definitely awesome. wanting to come uh and they came out to the show and, and they, and they, I, I considered XTC to be, to be heroes in, in an almost untouchable way. So it was, uh, it was, uh, mind blowing to, to see them backstage and spend time with them and find out just how, you know, totally cool and relaxed and human they were and, and fun and funny and very, uh, uh, just friendly, cool guys. And, 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 the, and at that point they said, you know what, uh, we're going to, in a few months, we'll be in Los Angeles making our next record. And they said to Scott and I, if you want to come and, and just hang out while we're making the record, it would be great to see you. So that was the album that turned out to be oranges and lemons. 
and and I was living in San Diego at the time and they were recording in LA, but literally every time I could manage to drive out to LA to, to, to just spend time with them and watch them make that record, I would. And, you know, when Scott was living in LA, so I think he probably spent more time than, than I did, but, but it was, you know, I, I always say that it was tantamount to, you know, sitting in the corner while Sergeant Pepper was being made for, for, to, for me to be able to, to actually, be there while they were making that record was was incredible and i would usually stay uh at uh, each each member of the of xtc was what they were being put up by by the record company in this in this uh kind of like the apartment complex uh uh on barham uh, near uh universal studios and and uh, and i would stay at dave gregory's because uh Andy and Colin both had their families visiting a lot of the time. Uh, so I ended up sort of gravitating towards Dave since he was there on his own and we would just hang out constantly and we became friends. And, and, uh, and so I, I became closer to Dave than I did to Andy, but whenever I would go to, to the UK to play with whoever I might be on the road with, uh, I would end up spending, spending some time at, uh, at Dave's place in Swindon which was not too far from Andy's place in Swindon. So, you know, I stayed in touch with Andy through Dave pretty much. Okay. Occasionally I would get on the, on the phone to Andy just to touch base and see what was going on. And we would send letters to actual snail mail letters to one another. So for a couple of decades, that was, that was the nature of the relationship, just sort of like being in touch with each other every once in a while. And then, like I say, I can't remember which of us proposed it. Why don't we, why aren't we trying to write stuff together? Because he had written some, when I put out uh, Wooden Smoke in 2001, he wrote a, a beautiful little blurb about it. Uh, and I was really moved by what he said about my music. And it just, it, you know, it blew, blew my mind that, that Andy had, you know, these feelings about what I was doing, considering the feelings I had about what he was doing. It was, it, it was obviously a, you know, we mutually had a lot of respect for each other. So it made sense for us to finally start to try to write some stuff. So that's what had happened. I, I, I two separate one week, uh, writing sessions. One was in 2006, another one in 2008 where, you know, there's, and there was no way Andy was going to come to the U S uh, right. and this was also you know, far before zoom or anything along those lines. So if, if I wanted to write with Andy, that meant me flying over there and, and hanging out in Swindon for, for a week. So there were, there were two intensive week long writing sessions, two years apart. And I, in my mind, I had thought maybe we would do a, a third writing session, but then I, I read an interview online with Andy where somebody asked him, so what's, what's happening with the material that you're writing with Mike Keneally? And he said, I have no idea. I, I expected that, that he would have done something with it by now. I'm, I, I don't know what's taking him so long. And <laughs> no, pr so no pressure went, there. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was the deal. I thought we were just sort of like taking our time. Uh, now I realized that he, as far as he was concerned, he was kind of done with his end of it and he was waiting for me to take it somewhere. Uh -huh. So that was all I needed to hear. So I, I, I took the, the material that he had, he and I had written, which was about eight songs. Uh, and then I, you know, I recorded it and all, and all the stuff was, I had some stuff that he and I had recorded when we demoed the material in his shed in Swindon. Right. And I, uh, and I took some elements from those demos and, and sort of fed them into the final recordings. But the, the vast majority of the stuff was me, uh, on my own recording in, in California. And then I had, uh, Marco Miniman do the drums on the stuff. Uh, so Andy doesn't appear on the album, uh, apart from some drum programming that he did. And then there was one track that we did this really weird little instrumental called indicator that he plays uh, guitar on. Uh, but I, I, I didn't put that out on wing beat. I put it on the next record after that, which was called, right. um, you must be this tall. Um, so, uh, so even though Andy doesn't appear, uh, physically <laughs> performing on the Wingbeat Fantastic album, his writing is all over it and his DNA is all over it. And that was exactly and, where I was going. And, and sometimes I, even though it's me doing all the singing, I feel like you can hear him singing through me. Um, because there are parts where I felt like I was channeling him vocally. Um, 
and obviously lyrically uh, his imprimatur is all over the place. And some of the lyrics like you kill me is entirely his lyric. Uh, and there, it, the song uh, I'm raining here inside was a, a, a oh, famous you, lyric you. that he had had for several years before we got together. And, and he was like, I have this finished lyric and I keep trying to write music to it and I can't, I can't come up with anything. And he said he'd given it to other people to try to write music to, and they hadn't come up with anything. And I, I, okay. I said, well, show me the lyric. And he put it up on a piano and I, and literally just reading the lyric, I could hear the song. And I start and I started playing wow. the, the, the whole chord progression on the piano and, and like singing it. And within five minutes, the basic structure of the thing had come together. So that was just like the easiest collaboration of the whole album because his lyric was already done. And I looked at the, the printed page and the song just sang itself at me. So wow. it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a good productive time. And, and I'm very happy with the album that would that most importantly, he was happy with the album. And I felt like <laughs> that was, that, that was the done. audience I was trying to please with that. Right. I, I made Wingby fantastic for an audience of one, you know, <laughs> and, and Andy, who is one of the best songwriters on the planet, but doesn't write enough songs. You know, he, he's undergone uh, periods of, of, of writer's block and, or just feeling like, you know, especially once XTC was done, I think he had feelings of, well, what's, what's the point? Why should right. I be writing songs at all? It, it's the, the industry is not receptive, but he, he's, he's such a, a brilliant writer. It was just kind of breaking my heart that he wasn't, he wasn't being more productive. So I was, I was, uh, you know, happy to be a, a conduit for just some more of his writing, you know, Nice. but anyway, heard of music like that, like that. And, and your solo stuff, I call it in telepop. It's a, uh, it's pop music, but it's too smart for commercial radio. You know, it's just, if you sit there and listen to what's going on, songs on that album that, that I, I, it's, it's one of those things I even put it in my book, which you were kind enough to write the forward for. I forgot to, plug that i really appreciate that but it's the oh, kind of it's the kind of music that <laughs> i I'm, I'm glad i'm part of the club that knows about your music and i'd love to see you play it play it play it in an arena or you know a large theater or something like that but at the same time i'm selfish you know, <laughs> you know this is this is mine you 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 get that stuff so i i understand your dilemma when you when you talk about trying I don't to think of it as, as arena music but i do think of it as theater music and i've i've, I've always felt like it in terms of what my sort of goal was for my own music was just like really, you know, nice, uh, not too large seated theaters with, with, you know, good sound systems and, and, uh, a large enough stage to, to do some kind of reasonable stage presentation with some nice, uh, mixed media stuff going on and just, you know, do a, a, a really nice, a, a lovely evening at the theater. I, you know, I, I, makes I, sense. my music is like, is really well suited for that. But it's also well suited for you know a, a sweaty time in a nightclub. It's just that, that uh, um, to do the theater thing, obviously you need a you, you need some kind of a, of a an infrastructure to support it that that costs money, and you also oh, yeah. need a lot of rehearsal time, not just for for the band to know the songs, but to get uh, you know, at least the type of thing I envision where there's there's visuals and stuff going on. It, it's it takes time and and uh an entourage and all kinds of stuff that the, the budget just doesn't exist for so even though there's there's literally no budget for it uh, the, 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 right. my music has ended up in the uh in the nightclubs instead and but it, but that has resulted in things like that live album that you held up the baked potato in los angeles has been the most supportive uh venue uh, for, for me and my music, uh, since, uh, the late nineties, you know, coming up yeah. on a, on a quarter century that, that I've been playing at the baked potato. And, uh, it's a, a classic, wonderful, small, which is cool because it means it's not a struggle to fill it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's always nice when you can, when you can uh, sell out a show, even if it's a small venue, it's, you know, psychologically that's helpful. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, everybody that's in that room is like really focused on what's happening on the stage. It's not like a, the, the kind of social event where people are just, you know, taking pictures of themselves with the stage in the background. Everybody is, is like is laser focused on what's happening and listening to all of it. So that's, you know, if, if, if I, if, 
if the the pieces aren't in place for me to be doing the the kind of theater tour that I envision and which ultimately I still hope happens um at least there's rooms like the big potato where there are, are are people there who understand what what we're doing and and appreciate it and and uh you know there are I don't take that for granted because there are a lot of really talented musicians who don't even get that much, you know, or sure, they, sure. they never get the opportunity to even have a band willing to put in the time to learn their music. And I've got incredible musicians in my band and I have, there are many, uh, it's, you know, it, not many in the, in the, in the, again, in the Taylor Swift sense, but you know, uh, 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 there are people around the world who know what I'm doing and, 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 that is a, that gives me a warm feeling to know that if I, you know, when I come out with a new record in January, that there are still people who are eager to hear it, you know, and that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I, I'm very, very grateful and, and, and humbled by that. You talked about uh, the importance of being locked in, which kind of leads me to right, to right where I was going. It's like we have a psychic connection here. First time I saw you live was in 2001 at this dingy little club called uh, the Galaxy in St. Louis. Uh, you were supporting uh, Project Object, Ike yep. Willis's band. And uh, I was literally leaning on your wedge monitor. I, I was right underneath you. <laughs> and there's, right. there's no way you remember this, but you caught me uh, air guitaring. You had just released this wonderful record, <laughs> Dancing with Beer for Dolphins. It's now 22 years old. And had I been paying attention, we'd have had this chat you know, two years ago. <laughs> you caught me uh you, you played live in japan and i was just i have a habit of air guitaring with my right hand and you just happened to look down and somebody kind of went oh you know this one that's that's like yeah i, I love this one that's this awesome. is without going into the favorite child thing this is the record i come back to so frequently if you look carefully you can see that somebody i know autographed this for me yeah, I'm good <laughs> <or something. laughs> back in 2001 you had a pretty good sized band for that, for that club. Um, yeah, that that was you know <laughs> that was the the damn the torpedoes kind of tour where you know we we just uh, decided. Well, I would, Scott Chatfield and I have this record label Exowax, and and we just said, okay, we're, we'll we'll foot the bill uh, okay. for a seven piece band to go on the road. Um, and uh, you know we were lucky to have these amazing musicians who uh, were willing to work for a very meager paycheck and and uh, and stay in not very fancy hotels in in order to to go around the the, the country and play this music. But you know I, I was like I was on an idealistic high at that point in my life where I felt so strongly about that album and about that band and those songs, and I just felt like. Oh, the world needs to hear this, you know. It's, it's like, it doesn't you're matter not, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm a bit more pragmatic about it about the uh, the financial realities behind. It. I'm 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 grateful that I had that that uh, that you know kiss and vinegar at the time to to just like uh, just like say, well, I, we, I'm I don't know, it might, it might not work, but I got no choice. I have to do this, you know. Right. I have to take this band on the road. I have to play these songs. Well, it's we not did. just that the songs. There's so much variety in in what you're playing here. It's 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 four distinct sides uh, of music, and you kind of bounce from here to there. I mean, I hear things that sound like the Carpenters. I hear things that sound like you know they belong in the Smoky Nightclub. I, you know, you've got a couple of sizzling instrumentals. I mean, it's it's a wildly eclectic record. I mean, how long did it take for all that to come together for you? That 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 was probably about a two year gestation period for the, for the songs on that record because I know that some of them, like uh, pretty enough for girls and and uh, uh, without having the album in front of me, I can't. I, I know that uh, I think Ragged Give Ass. Me a hint, and I've got a few, a few of those tunes had were in the live repertoire as early as as nineteen ninety eight. And okay. from 1998 to, to 2000, I was going through, which interestingly enough, some of this was, was, was brought about by my complete obsession with the uh, okay computer at the time. Um, Good obsession. That, that album had a, like a, a life changing uh, impact uh, for me and, and uh, various other things happening in my, my personal life at the time was, was, were just causing like uh, massive tectonic shifts uh, and, uh, and musically I was like, uh, 
I was just like wanting to, to work it out in real time as much as possible. I was going, I was living in, in San Diego, but driving to LA constantly, uh, to, to play with, uh, with beer for dolphins and, and the, the, the lineup of beer for dolphins was like shifting weekly, depending on who was available. So, you know, one week it might be Tospanos on drums. The next week it was Joe Travers. And, you know, at, at some point, uh, I did, uh, some, some performances with, uh, the bass player from, uh, Ambrosia, Joe Puerta. And, okay. and the, 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 he had a solo project called sunken city. And some of this stuff is on YouTube. So from 1998 of me uh, performing live with, with Joe Puerta and sunken city. And the drummer in that project was, a, was this young guy named Jason Harrison Smith. And, um, and he became very enthusiastic about playing my music. So I started doing shows with him. Rick Musalem came into the, the fold, uh, a sax player named Evan Francis came into the fold, uh, somewhere along that, this timeline, uh, this young kid, uh, who was going to Berkeley, uh, in, in Boston named Chris Opperman asked me if I would uh, produce his, uh, his debut solo record. And I went to Boston uh, and just like immersed myself in his world for a week and, and produced his first record. Uh, and the, uh, he had a percussionist, the, this, uh, young woman named, uh, Trisha Williams. At, uh, and she was, uh, she ended up getting folded into beer for dolphins al along with Chris. And so by the time, you know, all this stuff had, had uh, evolved, I had an eight piece band, uh, which, uh, which was the band that, that performs on, on the dancing record. And we did a, uh, we did like, a, a, a sort of a, 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 almost like a commune where we all went to Scott Chatfield's house for, uh, I can't remember how long, probably like a week. And it ended up, Frank, uh, Scott has a, a, a knack for, uh, for naming things. So he, he called it Camp Keneally. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and. And so we just, uh, set up camp in, in, in Scott's house and it, like all day round, we were, uh, we were working on the songs and the arrangements. And I, and when I was in, I was in, uh, I was on the road with, uh, with Steve Vai, uh, throughout like 97, 98, 99. Uh, and I was, I was like writing out all the arrangements for, for this stuff. Uh, so I had, I ended up with a stack of paper. Uh, for all the the sax parts and the and the trumpet parts and the and the marimba parts that that Trisha had to play and uh, keyboard parts for for Mark Ziegenhagen, who's a, a, another guy that 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 uh, entered into the fold. I knew him because he had gone to Berkeley School of Music with uh, with uh, Brian Beller and Joe Travers. Okay. And then uh, I did in 1991. There was a tribute to Frank uh, called Zappa's Universe in New York City. And Mark Ziegenhagen was, uh, was the, the pit orchestra keyboard player for, for that event. So, uh, you know, Mark was, was in my world. He ended up being in, in the four piece, uh, beer for dolphins that, that played a lot in 1998, uh, which was me and Brian Beller and Jason Harrison Smith and, and Mark Ziegenhagen. And, and we, uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the sort of, the uh, early, nascent versions of the arrangements on the, on the dancing album were, were put together in that, in that quartet tour. So yeah, it was just like a, a long gestation period with a lot of different, you know, hairy variations on things that, that culminated in us, uh, you know, spending time at Scott's house, putting these, these performances together and then going into the recording studio and pretty much, even though that's a very layered album with a lot of intricate stuff going on, a lot of it is virtually live recording because it's such a large band and the arrangements were so specific and, and we were, um, spiritually, we were very much aligned at that point. <laughs> and, and, and so we just, uh, like entered the studio on fire and, the, and the, all this stuff just came out. And I think that's a lot of people reference that album as, as being a, a, a favorite album of mine, uh, for them. And, uh, and I, I have a, a more, uh, a more complex relationship with it because I was, you know, I was inside myself while it was happening. And it was, you were, it was you were too close time. to it. It was an exciting time, but also a tumultuous time. And, and, uh, there are aspects of myself when I look back on, on, on th that whole period that I'm not 
pleased with, you know, just in, in terms of, you know, it's not to compare myself to John Lennon, but uh, it, it reminds me of, of, you know, reading, uh, one of my favorite books is a book called Lennon Remembers, which is his his uh, interviews with Jan Wenner uh, very shortly after the Beatles exploded, and right. uh, and he's he's just talking about uh, what bastards the Beatles were, you know, just like the, the Beatles were bastards, uh, and there are times where you go through periods in your life where you you feel like you're you're on a mission, and and that you're just you're serving some greater cause, and it feels like you're doing something which is the uh, which is almost divinely wrought. Um, but the reality of it is, is that it's, it's, it's having a, a, a real world impact on other people in your life that you might not have been uh, tuned in sufficiently with uh, at the time. And so when I look back at that time, I just think uh, just in terms of the, the shrapnel and the, and the impact it had on other people that I loved and, and should have treated better. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a, a, uh, complex era for me. So I don't have the same relationship with the dancing album that other people have, but I do. Uh, some of what you were going through definitely came out in your playing because it was, there was some aggressive guitar parts in there. And the nerd in me believes that most of those guitar parts came from right over your left shoulder, right there. <laughs> that, uh, well, that's actually, they came from up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, from a series of brown triangles, which, I, which I've, I've, I've spoken about too. Um, there's actually a piece on the album called "The Brown Triangles," and th there was there was a period of a few months there where I, every time I would be playing or improvising and close my eyes, I would see this configuration uh, of of ten brown triangles in the bowling pin formation, uh, and that and that if I if I uh, you know, I didn't question it and I didn't try to understand it. I just would like you know, the, the same, it was like they were speaking some other language to me. Uh, but I did find that if I, uh, surrendered to the energy that I was getting from whatever the hell this was, it was affecting my playing. And, and I was, and it was causing me to play things that I had never played before. I was hearing things that sounded to me as though it was John Coltrane, you know, or, or just like, all of a sudden, uh, stuff that that previously had felt beyond me was 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 starting to be, become effortless, and then it stopped. You know, then the, the brown triangles went away. But the, the there's there's a guitar solo on the record called the brown triangles, which was uh, it was uh, captured one of those moments, and I I actually like it a lot <laughs> when I listen to it. I, I do think that it it, ca it it catches me in a moment that. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound like anything else that I, that I had ever heard me play up to that point, at least. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I am happy that I was able to harness the weirdness that was going on and, and come up with an album that, that meant something to, to a bunch of people. And, and I do think that the writing is, is really good. And there's several songs on there that I think are, are, you know, every once in a while, I just, I, I would, I would enter a zone where it, it's, it, it surprises me a little bit to, to go back and, and, and see, you know, the, the songs that came out. Sluggo is another one. I think that, that Sluggo was a, a really good collection of songs. Um, it's, it's not every day someone comes up with a title like Skull Bubbles and just kind of <laughs> digs well, into it and it just, it just works brilliantly. I, I just love that tune. That's a, that's that's probably that that's definitely one of the more overt uh, expressions of some of the, the the stuff that I was you know, feeling and going through at the time. It was it was a hectic time psychologically. It was it was like a, a combination of this very idealistic, uh, you know, f feeling like some kind of a spiritual uh, a occurrence happening, and at the same time, just a feeling like dirt, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and going through, you know, periods of, you know, heavy suicidal ideation and, and stuff like that, which is, you know, what, what skull bubbles is, is, uh, is a, a, a painting of, of one of those moments. So, you know, it, it, if, if you're going to feel that way, you might as well write a song about it and try to get something good out of it. <laughs> Can we call that a cathartic moment? Was it therapeutic or? It yeah, it to, was to the, 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 the danger there though, is that for a long time, uh, it, whenever I would go onto stage to play that stuff, um, 
No, there's like, there's a couple of different ways to approach a song like that. One is, which is the, the approach I try to take now. If I play a song like that, that was written in, in the pits of some kind of despair, um, is to sort of uh, play it with a feeling of, uh, of, uh, celebration that I've gotten through it and, uh, and, you know, and, you know, play it as the person that I am now and, uh, and not, uh, not, you know, like go back into the, the, the realm that I was in when I actually right. wrote into, it. But the back then, were... back then it was still so fresh that when I would go on stage to play a song like that, I would instantly like go down deep into, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, dark place that, and to play the song. And, uh, and that's not healthy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, to, to constantly relive the, the, you know, the, the darkness that you were feeling when, when you wrote it. So, you know, n now I, I, I feel grateful that I was able to get songs out of those feelings. But if I play those songs, it's, it's been so long now, uh, that I, I feel like I can, I can go back and, and touch that without feeling that and being that again, you know, it's, it's I just, I have no desire to, to feel that way again. <laughs> I understand you're, you're doing an amazing job of answering my questions before I ask them, which I, okay. definitely, which I definitely appreciate. I was wondering, is, is this, uh, given the opportunity and, and with the understanding that we have to take a pragmatic approach to, to the industry these days, is that the kind of record you would go back to and do uh, a 20 or 25th anniversary tour of, you know, and kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of people like to play records, you know, front to back if they're, if they're really meaningful, is that something you find appealing or are you more about the now? I am, I'm certainly more about the now, but I also like the idea of celebrating the, the, the milestones, but, but it's like, the the reality of, of, of things is that in order to do something like that it just it requires so much time and, and attention and money um that it's, it it might not be feasible uh, like this this also happens to be uh 2022 the 30th anniversary of my debut album hat which is wow. also yes, is. uh you know as it was as it was my my debut album you know arguably the most significant album I've, I've done because it, it's, it was my, this was my entry into the world as, as a solo artist. And I had so much I, I wanted to express. Um, and so I could have like said, I'm going to go out and do a, a 30th anniversary tour for the hat record. Um, but there's, there's no feasible way to play everything on that record. Cause that record is insane. Um, <laughs> You know, there's, it, it ends with this 15 minute song called lightning Roy that I would, I would never, I, I, I would, I, I could never feel good about forcing a, a group of live musicians to play that entire composition. Because it's just, <laughs> and yet it's, the fans would be there, you know, I, well, there, I mean, there are that? people that would love to hear that in, including myself. And there are, and there are probably musicians that would be willing to, to like put in the time to, to learn that. Uh, not everybody in my band, I can assure you, because <laughs> uh, these are busy gentlemen and it's, and it's asking a lot. Um, right. uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, so there's certainly there's a part of me that uh, like thinks, oh man, I would love to just like go through my repertoire and really, you know, find a group of, of young musicians who are like bizarrely willing to, to put in the time, not just that, but like you know, the, the younger breed of musicians is, is there are some, some guys who are so absurdly talented Yeah, things that would have been such a struggle for us to, to pull off 30 years ago. And now it's just like breathing, uh, for, to these younger musicians who are just ridiculous. So I, I, there's I other stuff I can't even, so there's other stuff I can't even fathom hearing on stage. Uh, I'm going to get the title wrong. Is it looking for Nana? Or looking for Nina on Slug Nina, Slug Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I adored that track, and, and I, and I played it for a friend of mine. He kind of looked at me, like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this is this is brilliant. That's, that's that's one of the songs. There's there's like a subset of my repertoire that that uh, can only be described as music that I can't believe I had the nerve to release. <laughs> It's well, so, you did. it's like so obscure and arcane and weird, 
uh, you know, and I did another uh, version of that from that album would be this weird little thing called "I Guess I'll Peanut," which is yeah. a uh, which was a, just as a, literally a, a, like a, a snapshot of a dream that I had. You know, it's and, and dreams can't be explained or or you know, there's there's no logic to them. So and there's no logic to the, I guess I'll Peanut, but it was just a, an audio painting of a moment that I wanted to do. Um, or on on the hat album there's this weird little character study called Eno and the actor which is which is so peculiar um and it's 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 a total it's totally a lie it's not based on anything but just you know my fevered imagination and and uh and musically it's really really strange so anybody you know i know that there's like certain people who w- would buy my records because they heard me with Steve Vai or Satriani or or Zappa and be like waiting for the instrumental fireworks and then suddenly they have to contend with something as as bizarre and uh inexplicable as Eno and the actor uh but that just delights me you know I, that, <laughs> because I, I i grew up being really excited by by certain uh, kinds of entertainment uh where things would just get so obscure and and it would sound almost like a private joke but at the same time, I would just get a thrill out of the fact that I felt like I was in on it, you know, uh, so, so, and often this would be comedy, you know, it's stuff like Fireside Theater or Monty Python or, you know, uh, with the Michael O'Donohue, uh, with the National Lampoon and, and just these sure. it, 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 very, really specific kind of under, almost underground type of alternative comedy where, the feeling I would always get was, I can't believe they got away with it. I can't believe that, that they're actually allowed to do it. And then later on in the nineties, my, one of my favorite comedy shows was this sketch show called Mr. Show with uh, Bob O'Connor and David Cross. It's just amazing. It's just brilliant. It's wonderful. And every week it would be like, they would just find such great ways to tie all these concepts together in a way that was satisfying and always just like, yes, they did it. They got away with it. I can't believe they got away with it. So that I I like that feeling, and I and I think that all my records have you know a certain. <laughs> you know, since you know the guys at the label really well, I'm sure they won't uh, <laughs> they won't mind. And going in the other direction, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. My personal saying is never ignore the muse when she when she gives you something. Just accept it and uh, and run with it, <laughs> because you know. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Makes sense. And you talked earlier about people who are looking for the for the fireworks, you know, on your records. And I'm thinking to myself, you've watched this guy duplicate what Steve Vai is playing. And then he goes in the studio and he creates Joe, which is pretty much the polar opposite of, of what was going on in that state. But it works. You know, it absolutely works. You have, I can tell, a really diverse background between between Joe and is it only Mondays, which is my, uh, that's, that's my Carpenters too. That's, that's instantly what came to mind. Is that what was going on in your head?
Yes. I think people need to grasp, and I've started scolding people the way Stephen Wilson has been scolding people, that, that musicians love music. They're not thinking about genre. They're not thinking about, you know, it's not it's not prog enough or what have you. It's a song. It's, it's part of you. It needs to come forth. feeling of 
when you connect with an audience member. I, that's why I love club gigs because I can get, I can lean on your wedge and look up and, and see how you're playing. And you can look down and see this guy you've never seen in your life with this right hand moving to, to your solo. That's got to have some kind of impact on what you're doing, even in that moment. And for what it's worth, I still do it. I'm, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> I, I do it in my living room. So it, it's, it's the same thing. I don't want to keep you. Yeah, this is so much fun, but I, I don't want to keep you all day. I know you've got uh, you've got stuff to do. Uh, you, your CDs, like you said, are starting to go out of print. Where can we find you? How can we get more people to uh, hear what you're putting out? <laughs> I like it already. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're a little behind. <laughs> well, Bruce Springsteen just put out a record of soul covers, and now we get to check out uh, what you've been doing. Mike and Lee, I can't thank you enough. This is far and away one of the more one of the more fear, fun things I've ever done. I want people to, first of all, like this video and go down to the comments and tell me about your, your Mike Keneally experience. It might be with Zappa, it might be with Steve Vai, it might be with whomever it is, but I hope everybody shares their experience. I've thanked you a thousand times for writing the foreword for my book, and I'm going to do it again because, because I really, really appreciated that. It was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> neither can I <laughs> we'll see how it goes Mike thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk to us and we will see you out there soon